Let me first begin with a, well, first let me thank Saki for, uh, for inviting, uh, inviting us back again this year. We were, uh, we were, we attended and presented at, uh, at last year's conference. Artifacts is living proof of the value of this meeting, both for networking purposes generally, but also for specific collaborations and partnerships that come out of it um, by virtue of a collaboration we have with the Max Planck Digital Library that, Jan that James just alluded to. Uh, the, the collaboration we have with uh, 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 Ahmet Chismeli from Pranageo and the uh, integration that he'll demonstrate uh, shortly uh, with their MELDA application in our system. And certainly it's always good to be here with, uh, with uh, good, good, former, good friends and former colleague uh, Wei-Fu Wang from IES Group. Um, let, me, let me ask for a show of hands, two questions. A show of hands. Familiarity with artifacts and, and what we do, what we're about, who's familiar? Okay, good, so most, mostly no, so this, this, will, this will be news for most of you. Um, second question, or collection of questions. How many of you author papers, cite the works of others, use Google Docs, have used Mendeley, uh, and, uh, and, and, um, and have submitted uh, a paper for, for publication. Could I just see a show of hands there? All right, perfect, that's even better. Artifacts is for you. So, so what is Artifacts? What does it do? What are we about? We're about enabling secure and immediate access to research material, accelerating the research process while ensuring researchers receive credit for their work. We are very researcher-centric at Artifacts. We deliver the benefits for both the creators of science and their institutions, the institutions that support the scientific enterprise that are in this scientific information value chain by providing access to previously hidden research findings and giving researchers credit for their work, or actually enabling researchers to give each other credit for their work. Secondly, by allowing scientists to do three fundamentally important things. First, establish proof of existence, authorship, and confirm provenance at any time for any type of work. Protect, manage research material while concurrently facilitating knowledge sharing. And thirdly, to provide and receive valid breakproof attribution and assignment of credit at any point for any research output. Now earlier this, this morning, Wei Fu referenced uh, Eugene Garfield, who is uh, who has since uh, passed away, but Eugene uh, with whom I worked with for many years uh, and uh, essentially was part of the team that, that built and, and created the Web of Science. Uh, Eugene was, was famous for quoting Thomas Merton and the, the quote included the phrase that citations are the currency of science. And by that what he meant was that, that citations are used, acknowledgement of prior work that one's current work is built upon should be properly and appropriately acknowledged, recognized, and explicitly uh, expressed. Common practice in scholarship today. Well, one thing that Eugene never said, and by the way, he is credited by Sergey Brin for the page rank, uh, and Larry Page for the page rank algorithm, right? And, and, and so Eugene not only had a significant impact in the field of science and scholarship, but it's essentially what the, the, the operating mechanism that drove the evolution uh, and growth of, of Google and other, and other similar systems. Well, one thing that Dr. Garfield never said was citations should only be able to be given to some things. And that's where Artifacts focuses. So what we do is we expand the transparency of research findings by making them quickly and easily accessible and citable. So the model or metaphor for, that we use for this information space is, is the following. That 
historically and today, the primary zone of discoverability is this information space that's out here. Essentially, the published literature and of what's published, what's indexed. Now, any of you who have, who have submitted a paper for publication, you, you may have experienced having to go through a series of submissions in serial fashion to get your paper published. If you're fortunate enough to be published, indeed, are you published in a journal that's indexed by some of the major commercial indexes that are used in academia? Namely, the Web of Science is one, Scopus is another, or you may get indexed and picked up by Google, Google Scholar, right? But then again, if you're not indexed, your work can't be found. But what I would, what I would hazard to say here is that this information space is well-mined, it's well-served, there is a, a massive ecosystem of commercial and open access, non-for-profit non organizations that make published and indexed information available. That's wonderful. That's not where Artifacts is focused. Artifacts is focused on providing access to, this, the, to the broad remit of information and data and results and all of the different scientific and research artifacts, we're using the lowercase uh, version of that word, that are generated in the research process. And by collaborating with Max Planck and the Blocksburg Consortium's Blocksburg Trusted Infrastructure, enabling researchers to transact immutable proof of existence transactions on that ledger that is managed by that distributed network that you just saw described, but also importantly enabling control over with whom that information is shared and when it's shared, and then in turn when it's shared to enable that information to become citable. So suddenly, work that if we're all participating in the same research team and we have this wonderful grant from the German government to conduct a project, each of us is working in different capacities. We have different expertise, different, different specialties. Jens spoke of that very eloquently in his talk earlier this morning, right? Each of us are contributing in different ways. We want to be recognized and acknowledged for our contribution. What Artifacts does is enable contributors and the nature of their contributions to be specified and included as metadata that are embedded in a proof of existence transaction that is recorded onto the Blocksburg blockchain. And again, enabling each of us, or collectively as a project, to share our work with whomever we want when, when, when we want, or when our principal investigator authorizes us to share the work, right? There are, there are some controls there. So what we're building is essentially an index of this information this information landscape. And we believe that by enabling disclosure of these results, this vast repository is both indexed and readily discoverable. The creators can receive attribution that formally count toward researcher reputation. That's important for any of you in academia today. All right, I've, I've contributed to a project. Um, I've, re I've received citations to my data set, my methodology, my experimental design et cetera, my preprint, am I going to get credit for that? Well, academic institutions and the incentive structures and in institutions change slowly, but they are changing. And just recently, within the last six months, we've spoken with three institutions who have explicitly said to us, you know, what we really like about artifacts is it enables us to, to tangibly recognize and give credit to our researchers for works other than publications. And we've been, they've been saying to us and we've been saying to them, we want to give them that kind of credit. Finally, there's a system that enables that. And thirdly here, we believe we're, we're, not, oh, I, we're not intending to compete with the high value of this information, the, in, the information content that's in the published literature, right? We're not competing with that. What Artifacts is doing is, we believe, is quite complementary. And eventually, 
this index, we foresee that this index will be joined together with the indices that very capably cover published literature. But as I said earlier, those ind indices don't index all the published literature. So again, if you publish and you're not indexed, you can't be found unless you happen to attend a conference or you're from a third or fourth world country and you can't afford to attend an international conference. And by the way, no one went to the library to actually pull a print edition off the shelves to find your publication, all right? So the complementarity of artifacts in Blocksburg, all right? So what we're doing off-chain, what we're doing, what we're doing on-chain. It's, Im it's important, I think, to, to point out a little bit of workflow here, and I'll have another workflow slide in a moment, that the content com be becomes known to our system in multiple ways, one of which is by researchers who use our platform. We're a live platform and system. We've been available since March of, 20, uh, March of 2018, um, and we're continuing to evolve that platform. Does it, has, does it have everything that our envision, that our vision uh, envisions yet? No, we're continuing on that path. But the content becomes known to our system by researchers who interface with our, with our platform, also via the tools that they're using. And you'll see Jason Rollins, uh, a colleague of mine with Artifacts, demonstrate uh, momentarily some of the latest implementations that uh, are brand new for us to announce here at, at the conference this week. And also, of course, through APIs, so direct implementations that we have with third-party systems and tools and APIs that we've, that we've built to interoperate with systems. What was just spoken of earlier uh, by James. So we have interop we're building interoperability um, with, a, with a journal and their publishing peer review slash distribution content partner to provide these services. So what do we do, what do, do off-chain? Well, the magic that we do off-chain is, is, pretty, is pretty basic metadata management. Artifacts does not need to house or control or store your content. Now, today, admittedly, when we hash a file of yours uh, and we add and we add automatically some metadata to that file and any metadata that you've added to that file and transact it onto the Blocksburg ledger, today we need to instant instantaneously hold that file to hash it. Right, so that's, that's today. Roll forward in three to five months and we'll complete the development work that we're doing that will enable us to do localized hashing so the hashing can be done within your operating environment, within your, within your workplace. So we obviously know we, we, that that's a step that we have to develop and, and, and it's a natural one, one where any organiz some organizations are not going to want their data files to leave their organization even if it's to a, a party that they should, they believe they should trust, such as artifacts, that file has still left their environment, and they have to believe that that no one that it's secure, and that we dismiss it and delete it after processing it. So that's a step that that we have yet to build. But the on the on chain work, uh, the the on chain work, and and that heavy lifting, if you will, comes comes to us by virtue of of the Blocksburg Consortium platform that, that you've seen James describe. So how researchers be, uh, benefit from this, from, this, uh, from this collaboration between Artifacts and Blocksburg? Well, first, the consortium provides that trusted and decentralized infrastructure. Um, the question was asked of James earlier, are you a profit or nonprofit? In their case, they're a nonprofit. In our case, we are, we are a for-profit organization. It's important for us as a for-profit organization to transact these data in such a way that they are placed on a trusted network that is not controlled by us, that is accessible by the global research community. And as you heard James describe, that Blocksburg Consortium information network is accessible to all researchers, not just those that are affiliated with consortium members. Secondly, our smart contracts embed metadata, making these works discoverable. They embed the metadata that, that, we, can, that we can infer, but, they, but the smart contract also embeds metadata that you as a researcher, as a creator of that work, include with, with that file. Why would you do that? Well, 
You do that when you've decided to make your work discoverable by others, and you want it to be discovered. And how do we humans find things? Through keyword searches and other mechanisms. Integration with the Edmund repository makes the, that makes these works citable. Now, the Edmund repository is a specific repository that's used within the Max Planck Institutes. It is one of many resources across the institutes where research outputs uh, are, 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 are stored and made accessible to the broader research community. The benefit to the Max Planck researchers, of course, here is that we have interoperability with a core repository that they use. That is an example of many integrations that you'll see us, that you'll see us deliver going forward because each of you who are conducting research want to, f your, your institution, your employer, the organization that is funding your research is going to want your, your work, your work products to find their way into an accessible place. Source files remain within the researcher's control, choosing which works to share and with whom, notwithstanding the caveat that I, that I just spoke of. E we have easy onboarding for first timers posting to the blockchain, right? Well, I'm old enough to remember when, when the internet didn't exist for the general public and I first did something on the internet, right? Um, for those of you that didn't have that uh, chronological opportunity, um, m many of you in this room have had a first experience uh, with a blockchain. But you're the minority of the research community out there. Most researchers haven't done anything on blockchain. And reality is, from our perspective, we don't necessarily need or want researchers to care or necessarily see the blockchain aspect of this. We provide transparency, and they can see these transactions and so forth. What researchers will care about is the trusted infrastructure that houses these transactions. And again, that's Blocksburg. Uh, how many of you are familiar with ORCID? How many of you have ORCID IDs? If you don't have an ORCID ID and you're a researcher and you publish, I recommend you get one. And that's not just because I'm a co-founder of ORCID. Um, but our integration with ORCID uh, enables one's CV and profile to be kept current. Simply put, works that, that a researcher creates and manages using our infrastructure can seamlessly update their ORCID, their ORCID dash, their ORCID profile. It's not called a profile, I think they call it a record, right? So works, it would update the works section, for example, of your, of your ORCID record. Similarly, our system, Artifacts, can learn about you and your interests when you decide to share your ORCID record information with our system. It's not required, it's optional, but it's highly valuable. Citations made using Google add-on update researchers' dashboards instantly and API services that enable interoperability. Some of, both of these are combined together in, in what I'll speak of here. Um, so again, those of you who write papers and author, you've, you tool, you've used tools like EndNote, you've used, um, you've used Mendeley, you've used Zotero, wonderful tools, they've existed for decades. What's their value add in terms of publishing? Well, they have the information and the intelligence the formatting rules for bibliographies, in-text citations, and bibli bibliographies at the end of the paper. That's wonderful. And it can save you, depending upon how many citations you have in your bibliography, can save you hours of work if you've submitted to publisher A and they've rejected your paper and you need to submit to publisher B and, oh, they have a different format requirement, right? Well, in the old days, you had to retype everything manually. Well, we've done that an order of magnitude better and as Jason will show in a moment, the interoperability we have with Google add-on enables one who's authoring in Google, uh, in Google Docs, excuse me, with Google Docs who's authoring to be able to find and retrieve a reference. That's not so novel, you can do that with EndNote. Um, to cite that reference, to cite that reference in their paper, and what's really novel here, and, and that reinforces the vision that, that I expressed early on, the ability to enable researchers to give and receive citations in real time. So imagine yourself writing an article, citing a colleague's work, and as you're writing that article, you drop that citation into the paper, and bing, 
your dashboard in artifacts indicates that you've just given a reference to that colleague and their dashboard in artifacts picks up the fact that they've just received a citation from you, okay? So how researchers and institutions benefit? Well, it's, integ it's integrating into the, workflow, uh, into the workflow. So just quickly here, to illustrate from, from, from left to right, data come, in, data come into our system from all manner of places in all manner of file types and variety. We're agnostic to, to file type. We love virtually every file type. Um, and, and that information comes in, again, in various ways, by direct interaction with the platform, through APIs and integrations with, uh, integrations with other third-party tools and systems. The, the off-chain work we do that translates into on-chain work is we enable proof of existence transactions that, are, that our smart, smart contract embeds uh, with, uh, with metadata. And then this section of the, of the workflow represents researchers interacting with the various tools and applications that they use, whether it's Google Docs, uh, whether it's a project management application such as, as Melda or others. And the consumers out here on the far right could be their institutions, their funding organizations, fund, uh, funders, um, the general public, and so forth. So today, Artifacts is, is collaborating with a, vi a variety of each of those types of, uh, of organizations, funders, publishers, uh, research institutions, uh, and, and others. And we would uh, be happy to uh, collaborate with any of you or your organizations in similar fashion. With that, let me conclude. Two minutes for questions. So I have, uh, there are a couple minutes for questions. I'm happy to take any questions now if there are. Great, thanks, great presentation. Thanks. Um, my question is, in the beginning you mentioned that the, um, the, one of the goals of the whole project is to get research recognition and probably some kind of a remuneration or reward for the multitude of things that he or she is doing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this somehow was uh, absent from the rest of the presentation. How exactly is this achieved? So I understand that your, your um, artifacts allows to record mm -hmm. things on the hash to index a multitude of texts, documents, raw data, whatever, mm -hmm. in the blockchain, but where, uh, where how does this, uh, incentives and reward and recognition uh, machinery comes in. Sure, yeah. Yeah, great question, thanks. So the, the incentive, we, we do, uh, well, the incentives are citations. We are not revolutionizing the, the, the academic research incentive structure. We're not applying token incentives, we're not monetizing those tokens, we're, we're not we're not engaged in a, a tokenized market. What we're doing is enabling citations to be given and received. We're tracking those. We're, we're, we are reporting those within an individual's dashboard in our system. Jason may be able to show that during the demonstration uh, immediately after my talk. Uh, and those citations, we believe, ultimately will be combined together by a researcher along with citations to their published literature that are reported in the Web of Science or, or Scopus. So it, it's, it's a citation to their work, and it just happens to be a pre-published work. And, and, and so the incentive here for the researcher, the payoff for them is this is the mechanism for them to accumulate citations in different ways and in a different channel than they currently are today. Okay. This system, this system enables citations. I can, I can give a citation. The Google Docs implementation, I can drop a citation in a paper today mm -hmm. to a work of yours, and if you have an Artifacts account, I have an Artifacts account, our system will recognize and count that I've given a, a, a citation to you and that you've received one. So it's an automatic process. I'm uh, the one who makes a citation. I am not supposed to give a doy or something. No. This is a citation. No. Question here? Um, how do you make money? What is your business model? 
Uh, great, uh, that's a great question. So I'll, I'll, I'll say first, uh, the, I'll answer a question you didn't ask, how don't we make money? <laughs> we don't make money by charging researchers to use the system. So the system is free at the point of use for, for individual researchers, small research teams. Ultimately, the business model, ultimately the business model that we envision here is one where, where there, where as the system, as users on the system grow, and as data on the system grows over time, that we will be able to, to essentially sell subscription access to analytics and information, only access to information that researchers individually have made publicly accessible but access to information that's on our platform that has been shared to their institutions or the funders of research or the publishers of research. So earlier this morning we saw a presentation uh, around peer review and, and, and decentralizing using, uh, using uh, blockchain to decentralize peer review. One of the challenges that editors have is finding peer reviewers. Our system can provide insight into identifying peer reviewers. So the business model ultimately is to monetize through selling subscription access to data and analytics. Thanks for asking that. Data and analytics. Data and analytics, yeah. There's a question in the back from Jens if we have time. Yes, as long as the computer is set up. They're still setting up. Yeah, yeah. I'll steal this time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Dave for uh, this excellent presentation. I'm just wondering, I mean, uh, pre-published data, right? You're talking about citations, but actually more than citations is this notorious H-index, right? So if I just have a p little bits of information, they might get cited once or twice, but let's say in the academic world, you want to more have like a 20 plus H-index, which means only citations, uh, only, only work that gets more than 20 citations really makes an impact. Right. Mm -hmm. So the met for the metrics of let's say more advanced academics, like these partial things which might get cited once or twice, um, might not be as valuable, right? Because they, they they're inefficient for your H index. The second thing is, uh, like it depends on the research field, but often it's difficult to um, attribute a certain achievement to a single researcher. Right. Let's say I'm the supervisor, I give something to a PhD student who works, uh, like giving them instruction, do this measurement, the PhD student does that, there's a postdoc, like looking over that, you know, and suddenly you have that PhD student and, and that happens in the real world, we're all real human beings thinking it's all his own, let me quickly file that yes. past any super line manager, supervisory, like I have done this. Right, and suddenly it's on the blockchain, and then you have like internal wars, because a postdoc will say, "Look, I sat with you every week. I told you at the beginning, don't do this, and got you on the right track." The supervisor said, "I got the money. I got that overall idea." So, how do you avoid swamping the system with it, and how do you avoid that this will kind of create like internal wars within the research teams? Because it's so easy for each of them to just quickly upload that on, on artifacts? Great, great question. Let me take the second one first. Um, how many of you are familiar with the credit taxonomy? Credit. The CASRE credit taxonomy. All right, so, so one approach that we've taken to addressing the question of, well, how do multiple contributors actually explicitly be, be recognized for their contributions for a given output? whatever that output may be. Now, if it's the paper, um, it could be the entire team. If it's a data set, uh, there, may be, there may be two or three individuals. The credit taxonomy, taxonomy provides, is essentially, uh, 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 the taxonomy provides a definition of different roles of contribution. So we've, uh, we've adopted that to enable individual contributors to, read, to express and register their contribution. Now, ultimately, it, it will come down to a principal investigator and her or his policy for acknowledging and recognizing work, right? But, but ultimately, the system that we've built enables the individual contributors to explicitly identify, and multiple contributors associated with a given artifact, to identify what their contributing roles have been. And I may have, I may have these two roles. Jens, you may have 
three other roles associated with a work product. So that that's that's one approach that we're taking. But, but sorry, just but this is not. I mean, this is like a quick upload, right? Mm -hmm. Where, like, over eager, let's say, post grad students or so could just do that with a single click. If I have a submission of a paper, right? It usually there is a certain procedure in place where this cannot go beyond some reporting levels, even the IP department, yes. uh, technology transfer office, depending on what you do, probably not so much in social sciences and so on, would, would have reviewed whether, let's say, this accreditation of authorships and so on is properly yes. done. Yes. Right, and here you have like a quick bypass for that, it seems to me. We're, we're, not, we're not bypassing that, I, and I really glossed over the workflow that's in our system, where, where the, the workflow enables the administrator, the principal investigator, to determine the rights and, and uh, the, the rights and terms under which those who have access to information or create information in the project, what, what their capabilities are. So those, those controls are, are within our system for those very reasons. Now, your, your first question, um, I'll just briefly comment on the fact, uh, on, on it this way, in that we have papers on the one hand and we have these artifacts. And, well, if these artifacts only receive one or two citations, is that really going to move the meter um, versus a paper that's published? Uh, I, what, I w what artifacts would argue, speaking for us broadly, is that we believe going forward, enabling these work products to become citable assets in and of themselves, their importance, some, not every output, not every work product, but some of those work products will rise to the level of significance and impact on, on other scholars' work to the same level of a paper. In fact, it may be more valuable for me to actually have access to your data set and your, your statistical uh, 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 algorithms that you, used, uh, that you used against it for my research rather than the paper itself. I may have learned about your work through the paper, but where I really advanced my work was through your data set. And that's what my, and we believe going forward, citations to those supplementary materials that complement the published work or may exist independent of a published work because that work was never published. It generated negative results. Now I know funders are interested in negative results because they don't want to refund something that someone else has proven can't work. But nobody publishes that. But that's all. Well, scholarly communications is a totally different talk. So with that, let me segue to Jason. Thank you.